To be honest with you, I've never experienced anything like this before. Morning, Minister. Citizens. The film unfolds on an ordinary day in the city. Suddenly, a traffic jam sparks a disturbance among the drivers. A businessman abruptly halts his car in the middle of the road to do sudden blindness, although he is unaware of the cause. Several individuals approach to assist him, and one man offers to drive him home. Upon arrival, it is revealed that the man who offered assistance is actually a thief who absconds with the businessman's car, leaving him stranded. The thief returns, feigning a different identity, and offers to assist the businessman to his apartment. However, the businessman, now wary, expels the thief. Once safely at home, the businessman's wife arrives and escorts him to a doctor due to his sudden loss of vision. They are quickly attended to by the doctor due to the emergency nature of the situation. Regrettably, despite the doctor's use of various equipment to examine the businessman's eyes, he is unable to detect any signs of damage or disease, leading him to conclude that the cause must be neurological. The businessman is advised to visit a hospital for further tests. This condition is something the doctor has never encountered before. After the couple departs, the doctor attends to his other patients, which include a child, a woman wearing sunglasses, and a man with an eye patch. Concurrently, the thief is driving the stolen car around the city, attempting to evade the police until he is forced to stop to do his own sudden blindness. He seeks help from the police, and when an officer escorts him to his former home, his ex-wife refuses to let him in. Later in the evening, the woman with the sunglasses visits a hotel. After requesting a drink from the bartender, she accompanies her client upstairs. Their meeting proceeds smoothly, but the pleasant aftermath is disrupted when she starts panicking as her vision turns white. The doctor returns home to enjoy a delightful dinner with his wife, and all is well until they wake up the next morning to find that he, too, is unable to see. They contact the hospital to alert them about a potential infection spreading, and their claim is taken seriously because the child is also there, unable to see. Soon, instances of sudden blindness begin to emerge throughout the city, and the government initiates measures to curb it. The doctor's office is shut down by the authorities, and the doctor himself is taken away for quarantine. His wife, unable to bear the thought of being separated from him, decides to feign blindness so that she can be quarantined with him. The couple being escorted to a deserted asylum, devoid of any other medical personnel. Each ward in the asylum is equipped with a phone for emergency contact with the guards outside, but it can only be used by a designated representative from each ward. Soon, more individuals, including a thief, the woman wearing sunglasses, a child, and a businessman, start to arrive. The doctor and his wife, who are part of the couple, decide to keep her ability to see a secret. She pretends to have explored and memorized the layout of the place upon their arrival. Consequently, she becomes a guide for everyone, assisting them with tasks such as using the restroom. During their first excursion out of the room, the thief walks behind the woman with the sunglasses and behaves inappropriately, prompting her to retaliate by kicking him in the leg. Her heel inflicts a serious wound. In the absence of a first aid kit, the doctor and his wife resort to using a shirt to bandage the wound. Later, the doctor's wife lies awake, consumed by worries about a possible infection in the thief's leg and the fear that she might wake up blind. The doctor attempts to engage in intimate activities with her, but she prefers to take a walk to alleviate her anxieties. The following morning, more people arrive at the asylum. The businessman is reunited with his wife, while the child expresses sadness that his mother has not yet arrived. The doctor and his wife attempt to communicate with the guards to seek help for the thief's leg, but their efforts are met with hostility. The guards brandish their weapons and force them to return to their room. Some time later, they receive their first food delivery, which is as inappetizing as a school or prison cafeteria meal and insufficient in quantity. The doctor's wife attempts to use the emergency phone to request more food and a first aid kit, but her call is answered by an answering machine, where she leaves numerous messages. As weeks pass, the number of infected individuals sent to the asylum increases daily. The doctor's wife ties a cloth line between the wards to serve as a guide, and the doctor is chosen as the representative of Ward 1. However, maintaining order soon becomes impossible as everyone is blind. They abandon concerns about cleanliness, and people begin to wander around without clothes, relieving themselves in the hallway. The businessman clung to memories like a sailor to a life buoy. He and his wife, once carefree lovers, now navigated the treacherous waters of despair. But while he sought solace in their shared past, she recoiled from it, unable to bear the weight of happier times. One fateful afternoon, the doctor's wife heard a distant murmur or radio concealed in the eyepatch man's possession. 
Its crackling voice carried fragments of a world unraveling. Desperation hung thick in the air. They all hungered for news beyond their desolate walls. The eye patch man, his gaze fixed on a horizon he could no longer see, relayed what little he knew. The first 24 hours had been chaos incarnate. Hundreds of cases emerged, and the government's solution was stark. The blind were sent to the asylum, while the rest were confined to their homes. Specialists convened in global conferences, their verbose discussions yielding no answers. Even they fell prey to the insidious sickness that now plagued humanity. Overseas, the situation mirrored their own. People grew wary of waiting, their homes becoming prisons. Soldiers patrolled the streets, resting anyone who dared breach the boundaries of isolation. Car crashes echoed through the empty city, and planes plummeted from the sky, their fiery descent a grim reminder of humanity's fragility. Fear settled like a shroud, and citizens retreated further into their homes. The once vibrant streets now lay deserted, a testament to their collective dread. The government, blinded by its own incompetence, remained impotent. Days blurred into weeks, and the city decayed a monument to abandonment. Then came the influx the infected, desperate souls brought to the asylum. The soldiers, once guardians, revealed their true nature. A gunshot rang out, and panic surged through the crowd. Bodies collided, doors splintered, and the wounded lay forgotten. The soldiers, aloof in their towers, made no move to collect the fallen. The doctor's wife, still feigning blindness, requested a shovel. The soldiers tossed it into the yard, their indifference palpable. She navigated their cruel jests, her fingers closing around the cold metal. Defiance burned within her as she flipped them the finger, an act of rebellion in a world gone mad. Meanwhile, the doctor orchestrated grim logistics. Representatives from other wards convened to coordinate burials. Two more lives extinguished by bullets, their fate sealed. And yet, amidst the chaos, the bartender declared himself king of Ward 3. His decree, our ward feasts while others labor, he proclaimed, a twisted hierarchy born from desperation. The doctor's wife, her heart heavy, ventured to check on the thief. Fever ravaged his body, his legs infected. She offers her support. However, the thief, aware of her sightedness, threatens her, causing her to retreat to her husband in a state of emotional collapse. The thief, unable to bear his suffering any longer, decides to expedite his end. He drags himself outside, presenting himself as a target for the soldiers. The doctor's wife is consumed by guilt and contemplates revealing her sightedness to everyone. However, the doctor dissuades her, expressing his concern over the evolution of their relationship from a marriage to something resembling a nurse-patient dynamic. As time passes, the bartender, with the assistance of a congenitally blind accountant from Ward 3, locates the administrative office of the asylum. Using the public address system, he declares himself the new leader of the asylum. His first decree is that food must be paid for, a rule that is met with chaos and resistance. In response to the ensuing pandemonium near the food storage, the bartender reveals his trump card, the handgun he had managed to retain upon his admission to the asylum. With a warning shot, he disperses the crowd, takes control of the food storage, and declares it will be guarded around the clock. He threatens to shoot anyone attempting to steal food. Faced with the threat of armed resistance, some consider non-compliance, but quickly realize the danger of opposing an armed adversary. The doctor's wife begins to collect valuables from rewards inhabitants, ranging from jewelry, including wedding rings, to miscellaneous items found in their pockets. She retains a pair of scissors discovered in a woman's bag. A child, having nothing to contribute, is promised payment by a woman who has assumed a maternal role for him. At the food storage, the accountant uses his tactile experience to assess the value of the items brought in. Regardless of the value of the jewelry, the bartender only allocates a few boxes of food per ward, threatening anyone who dares to protest. As a result, people are forced to share single-person meals. The doctor, feeling like a failure, withdraws from his leadership role. A woman wearing sunglasses approaches him to offer comfort, reminding him that there is little he can do against a gun. Their interaction takes an intimate turn, culminating in a physical encounter on a floor. The doctor's wife stumbles upon them in the midst of their intimate encounter. Rather than causing a scene, she confides in the woman wearing sunglasses that she can see, imploring her to keep her secret. A week later, when the asylum's residents have exhausted their resources, the bartender announces that they will accept services from women in exchange for food. The doctor's wife confronts the soldiers outside, demanding to know why new rations haven't arrived. They explain that they've given all they have and that rationing is now their responsibility. A debate ensues in Ward 1 about how to proceed. The doctor intervenes, asserting that it's not their place to force the women to do anything. 
If anyone wants to volunteer, it's their choice, and there will be no judgment or pressure from anyone else. After much contemplation, one woman finally volunteers, inspiring others, including the doctor's wife and the woman in sunglasses, to do the same. A businessman tries to prevent his wife from going, but she insists on being treated no differently than anyone else and goes anyway. The accountant arrives to escort the women to the food storage room, where they endure the worst night of their lives. The men are brutal and violent, and one of them goes so far as to kill one of the women. The next morning, the doctor's wife requests someone else to collect the food because the women have returned with the body, ready to clean her up and give her a proper farewell. Later that day, the accountant checks another ward for more volunteers, and even has the audacity to come to Ward 1 to congratulate them on a job well done, despite the fact that one of them didn't move much. It appears they don't realize that one of the women was dead, and they used her anyway. The doctor's wife informs him of this, leaving him speechless. All this taunting finally pushes the doctor's wife to her breaking point. She takes the scissors with her to the storage room, where everyone is distracted by the women from Ward 2. Without hesitation, she kills the bartender with the scissors before dragging the girls with her. The accountant realizes what has happened and retrieves the gun, but none of his shots hit their mark. On her way out, the doctor's wife makes her own announcement. If they don't release the food, more men will die. Now, she will be the one collecting the food. The doctor fears this will start a war, and he's right. Ward 3 barricades the area and still refuses to release the food. Ward 1 prepares to fight and reclaim what is theirs, but before they can act, one of the women decides to take revenge. She's kept a lighter hidden in her pocket all this time and uses it to sneak into Ward 3 and start a fire. The flames spread quickly, killing many men. Before panic can take over, the doctor's wife guides them out of the building. In a surprising turn of events, no one gets shot because the guards are no longer in their towers. The doors aren't locked either, which can only mean one thing, they're finally free. The doctor, his wife, the kid, the man with the eye patch, the woman with sunglasses, the businessman, and his wife decide to stick together as they make their way downtown. They discover that society has collapsed and the city has become a post-apocalyptic wasteland where the few remaining people wander around trying to survive, attacking each other if they even suspect there might be food in their pockets. The doctor and his wife leave the group hidden inside a bar while they go to the nearest market to see if they can find some food. The people there are grasping at the few things that are left on the shelves, but the doctor's wife, who can see, is able to find a set of stairs that takes her to a storage room while the doctor gathers clothes. After filling a few bags, the wife tries to make her way out, but the people there hear the noise the things in her bags make and jump on her to rob her. Fortunately, the doctor hears this and comes to help, pushing everyone away and putting himself between the crowd and his wife as a shield as they run out of the building. Once they're far enough away, the wife takes a moment to get herself together while the doctor goes back to retrieve the clothes he had dropped on their way out. A cute dog takes the chance to come closer and befriend her. Suddenly, to everyone's surprise, it begins raining, and the wife takes the dog with her inside a church to wait for her husband under a dry roof. The church is incredibly crowded and all the statues have had their eyes covered, yet a priest won't stop promoting the word of God. Outside, people are taking the chance to collect water and wash their bodies since they hadn't had clean water in a long time. The doctor comes back with the clothes and picks up his wife to rejoin the group, with the doc following them, becoming their new companion. The group eats some food inside the bar and decides to stay the night there to rest well. In the morning, they leave carefully through the city to reach the doctor's house. He and his wife have offered to let them stay. After that, the group starts a routine. They clean the apartment with the help of the doctor's wife, share the doctor's clothes, and only go outside to find food. They also collect water and wash when it rains. The man with the eye patch wants to stay with them forever because they've become like a family. The wife of the businessman reconnects with her husband, remembering their younger days. The doctor and his wife also reconnect. Now that she's not stressed anymore, she agrees to be intimate with him again. Weeks later, everyone is getting ready for breakfast when the businessman suddenly starts yelling. Just like blindness came suddenly, now it's gone and he can see again. Everyone celebrates because they realize their bodies can fight off the disease and blindness is temporary. This means there's hope for their futures. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe and see you in the next video.